Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series, facilitated by renowned educators. ISE podcasts are intended to teach beginning as well as seasoned investors the ins and outs of trading. To find an updated list of podcasts, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts. Please be sure to listen to our important message following this episode regarding the risks of investing in exchange-traded options. Now, again, compare that. Now, let's go over to the EUU, by the way. I'm looking at the EUR. You see that the EUU looks just like that, that, that Euro-US dollar pair is looking at as a Forex trader. All right? And as compared to the EUI, let me show you that real quick. I'm trading the EUI, that's fine. It's just kind of inverse, right? But I, I just I find it more comfortable for me to to not have to think, you know, long in one market or long in one market, but, but puts, you know, that kind of thing. So to me, the e- EUR, USD, and then the EUU make more sense. And again, here we have that resistance at 140. Okay, so certainly you can look for put options up in this area as, as we're looking at right now today. Okay, but as we start approaching 138, 137.80, the support of this uptrend, I, I might transition that strategy to going ahead and taking my put, realize, you know, go ahead and liquidating that put, and then looking again, once again, at, at, at purchasing a, a call. Okay? Again, trend, fo- trend following. Any questions? And, and I hope you're... Maybe there you're, is a question, but it has to do with more of a fundamental analysis. And uh, okay. it's John asking, he says, uh, yeah, he realizes that you're bullish on the yen, but he says, how... Why is this happening? Because uh, it seems like we have a, a, a guaranteed carry trade, and why is the yen rallying even though the interest rates are zero in Japan? Does that make sense to you? Uh, obviously, it does to the market. Well, you know, I think, you know, look, I, 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 it's very interesting when it comes to carry trades for me because I have a different take on the carry. And, and obviously, I would, and John, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, with that interest rate differential and, you look at the Aussie yen, or you, you know, look at any of these 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 countries that have the high, high interest rate versus the low interest rate in the, in the yen. You're right from that perspective. I don't know, know that the carry trade necessarily went anywhere, but the carry trade works best either within the context of the trend where you're able to just follow the trend. So, for example, you know, if you guys are looking at the Aussie yen, you know that you're trying to take advantage of selling or, or, or borrowing yen to fund the purchase of this higher-yielding asset, which is the Aussie dollar with its high, higher interest rate, okay? But the, the problem with that is the word carry trade to me, and I'm going to just get very basic with this, the word carry trade, you certainly want to take advantage of the carry, without a doubt, but within that, there's also the trade. We can't ignore the fact that directionally we can be very hurt in our, in our positions beyond the benefit of the interest rate return, okay, if we're on the wrong side of the trade. So to me, and, and again, this is just the way I've always been. I'm not a big fan of the carry. Carry is simply something that's either going to be a cost for, of my trade or I'm going to be able to benefit from it. But I don't get into a trade purely for the carry unless there is an underlying trade that makes sense based upon the directional you know, the directional bias of the market. So, you know, with traders buying yen right now, okay, with the yen strengthening, that does not help the carry's case whatsoever. So, you know, you think about your position, for example, in, in the daddy of carry trades, the Aussie yen, you know, this is not a good day. So it depends upon how much carry are you willing to you know, obviously, you're, you're, you're making their interest rate, but what point are you, you know, willing to, at what, what, ta- at what point are you on the wrong side of the trade itself? Does that make sense, John? But you're right. Um, you know, as long as the yen's cheap, that carry is viable, but at what point are you, you know, going to look back and say, well, you know, the, the currency itself, though, doesn't seem to be justifying my directional, you know, you are in a trade, so direction does matter, Right. 
So at what point doesn't it make sense? So, you know, I might be the wrong person to even answer that question because I don't like taking advantage of that as the main reason to get into a trade. To me, it's the gravy, you know. I'm in it for the meat and potatoes, but Kerry certainly is some tasty gravy if it's on your side. Right, Reggie, if you don't mind me interjecting, from a sure. security trader standpoint, uh, I agree with you because if you think about you don't buy stocks solely based on whether you're a fundamental analyst or you're a technical analyst. You don't buy them just based on the dividend yield. If you look at the high dividend yield, you better start to look to see if they can pay that dividend forever. Or you maybe you don't, if you're a technician, you're just more concerned with the trend. As you said, looking at just the carry itself only gives you a small picture of the whole um, investment itself. Yeah, that, you put it perfectly, Steve. That's a great, you know, that dividend analogy is exactly, exactly it. Absolutely. So, but thank you for that question, John. And, and again, I, I, I certainly don't disagree with you, but I think that to me, it's just a, a very small part of the trade. And, and, and one thing you bring up a great point is, you know, what if you're on the other side of the carry? You're paying it. You know, a lot of traders don't consider that enough as a cost of the trade. You know, there is a cost of the trade. It's not just, uh, uh, you know, if, if you're in the spot world, you know, there's a cost per trade in that regard. But, you know, for me, my whole hypothesis for the yen strengthening Again, I kind of went through all that, so I won't uh, rehash it, but, you know, it's, it's based upon that expectation of, again, the Dow being a factor, the dollar being a factor, and then, again, the, the earthquake basically hitting the accelerator on the fact that I felt that we we're going to get a breakdown from the consolidation. Right, so you change back. your mind. I mean, let me, this is just me asking. What if the Bank of Japan said, you know what, we're going to flood the system with yen because obviously we have significant problems. We're going to almost do quantitative easing like they've done in the United States. Just uh, They haven't done it in decades, so that's been their problem. But uh, what if they actually came up with, with something that the market thought was credible? What would you – you'd see it in the charts? Is, is that what you, you would uh, – is that what you'd be looking for, sort of a massive – move back up in U.S. dollar against yen? I think it would last all of about a day or two, because I think they've <laughs> tried that. Right. Oh, I mean, we've seen the way the, the foreign exchange just swallows up these, these right. intervention attempts, whether it was the Swiss right. franc. I mean, how many times have the, have the Swiss tried right. to blow up? You know, you know, I think the franc is a great example. So if we head on, you know, head on over to take a look at that chart, you know, so if you head back on, you know, for everyone watching, if you head back on over to ISE doc or for fxoptions.com, you'll see there's the SF, okay? So that's a great point, Steve, but I think, you know, how many times does the Swiss try to do that? Whether it's you're right. by, yeah, you're right. you know, by just kind of exactly, uh, you know, a rumor or whether they actually tr attempted it, it just, just didn't end up well for them. So going back to the YUK, you know, I think it would last a day or two. <laughs> I'd mark it up maybe back up to 83, and then right. I think the, the pair is going to do exactly what it was doing beforehand. Right. Because so it, it doesn't change. Some of your favorites are yen, strength still, and potentially Australian weakness. We haven't seen it yet, although we start seeing a little bit today, correct? Uh, you know, I, I'm anticipating more Australian weakness because I don't think we've reached any kind of significant support or floor. But the yen, right. you know, I'm I'm thinking the closer we get to 80, the closer we get down to 80.33, we might start building support once again. So I really need to make sure that I don't have um, expectations that are, are you know, uh, forgetting that we've had support in this area before at 80.33 to 80.50. As far as the uh, Aussie goes, though, I think we have more room for that for that <laughs> downside. So I'm actually a little bit more as far as forward to potential downside on the, the Aussie. And, and also, let's not, let's not forget that the Aussie headed down today. That if you take a look at uh, gold, and you look at the XAU USD 
see or you just go right to gold futures, you know, gold has had a rough day. <laughs> so right. the, not just that. Look at, look at also at crude. You know, you've had uh, the CL contract, you know, this, this you know, uh, Aussie and Comdol. You look at crude. We, we dipped bo- below $100 a barrel, down $3.5 today. So... So looking at remember when we you know, started. All that I, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. When we I, started I just, the session, all, we talked a little bit, just you and I, about the implied volatility of yen and Australian dollar being about the same. You actually think there's more power, more potential velocity on the Aussie relative to the yen? I just, yeah, I feel that the yen could be running into support pretty soon. Right. And. If that's the case, I don't need to be a bear uh, at a time where I could be looking at a floor. I just don't think right. that's necessarily a near-term floor. A lot of what's going to happen in the Aussie is tomorrow's follow-through on gold or tomorrow's follow-through on crude. If we want to see another leg down right. on that Aussie, uh, we really need crude to stay below 100. We really need gold to to continue to stay weak as well. So a lot of ifs there, but yes. Yeah. I think there's probably well, more trading, right? downside on the odds. All trading is contingency, so that, that's, that's great stuff. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, you know, those are those are basically three of my key, you know, uh, positions, three of my key strategies right now that I'm executing in the market right now. Two of them were sideways market strategies. One of them is a trending strategy. Exactly what I talked about on the, on the EUU, you could also look – to possibly execute on the uh, on the uh, Swissy, the Swiss franc. Um, so, you know, those are the, those are really where my where my head's at. I think that's where uh, we're going to be looking at a lot of volatility in the next few weeks. And I'm looking at options, and I was even three, four months ago. Right now because there's positions that I want to take. But with the kind of volatility we're seeing, I don't want to tie up my margin or expose myself in a way that I can't manage the risk. And, and this is where, in this environment, we may not be dealing with the trends we were once dealing with, but we're de- dealing with transitions in trends, which, um, again, while the psychology may be more difficult to put your finger on, I think the options are even more uh, well-suited to, to manage the risk of this environment. I agree. So that's I agree. pretty much my Chris, presentation Chris, I want for to give today, you gang. A moment. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. I want to give you a moment for any closing comments. Sure. Thank you. So, you know, really what I would love to encourage everybody to do is, first of all, find those speakers here on the archives, the ISC, that are, that are speaking your language, and find a way to take advantage of the power of the options. This is not about just talking about the, the, the currency market, the, the currency pair market. It's more about understanding the psychology of what these symbols are telling us and asking yourself whether or not an option would be a better way to manage, to handle, to profit from the psychology that we're seeing. And that's really what I hope to impress upon you, or I hope I did, for the past hour. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. I I sincerely appreciate it, and big thanks to the ISC and especially Steve for uh, for letting me come by again today. Reggie, right, I do have one other question. If we have a, if a lot of attendees, and uh, I've gotten some great comments, if somebody wants to contact you, uh, is it best on Twitter? What's the best way to learn more about the books that you've written or any other services that you might have? Well, you know, the easiest way, and, I, and I'm not really doing much by way of services any longer, but probably okay. the best to take advantage of would, would either be to visit me at RoggyHorner.com, which is my personal blog. Uh, again, I'm the chief currency strategist over at Interbank FX. And yeah, absolutely, like me, like everybody else, I'm on, I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook. And on Twitter, my, my uh, Twitter name is, is simply Roggy Horner. So feel free, absolutely, to follow me there as well. And, you can get updates on uh, on what I'm doing there, and and see what my my trading situation, strategies, thinking is all about. Maggie, thank you, and uh, 
can't wait to see what happens in the next couple of days. Uh, really loved your insight on uh, the yen and the Australian, two of the most timely of the pair. So thank you so much. Thanks a bunch for having me, Steve. And everyone, thank you so much. And uh, hopefully I'll see you out there in the, uh, on the web. And, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll think about how you can incorporate these tools and, and take better advantage of some of these moves we're getting uh, in a way that, again, can, can really uh, be a much more manageable risk. Because, gang, this is going to be a wild ride I think we're going to see for the remainder of the year. And I can't think of a better time to really start looking at what's happening on the options front and, and, and taking advantage of that volatility. Thank you, Aggie. Uh, we'll have to schedule another event. Uh, you're always so popular. So let's try to figure something out in May, and Ju May or June. But thanks so much, and I'll, I'll be in touch. Sounds great, my friend. Everyone take care. Take care. That was Reggie Warner. And again, if you'd like to contact Reggie Warner, um, you could get uh, Raggy at uh, twitter.com forward slash Raggy Horner, or you can go off to ibfx.com. Uh, she's uh, very popular. And, uh, again, raggyhorner.com is another great place. So please go seek out Raggy. Um, follow her. Uh, as uh, the couple of the uh, ideas, the insights that she gave us today, you'll be able to follow what she's doing over the next couple of days, weeks, and even months. Um, and hopefully she'll be back at the ISC real soon. Just want to, uh, you're seeing uh, on slide four, one of, of the SKU charts, you can get this. These are always free. So you're looking at the dollar yen, and you can look at the, the high volatility of the very short dated option as denoted by the red. Uh, and we can go through all of them very quickly. We have uh, the Canadian dollar. We have the euro. We have the Australian dollar. Uh, British pound, and the symbols are always right there, fxoptions.com. Uh, I want to thank Reggie Warner. Reggie, you did a great job. If you're still there, thanks so much. Looks like we lost it, but Reggie was wonderful today. Um, she is the chief currency analyst for the Interbank FX, and she does give her uh, daily insight uh, tips through uh, www.ibfx.com. So please join her there. Next week, Jack Crooks will be back with us. Jack hasn't been with us in a number of months, so he'll be back. Price Heedley the following week, Jason Ayers, and Jeff Gibby. Well, those will be the next four. And uh, if you're interested, we at the IAC will be uh, hosting another webinar in just 24 minutes. Where we'll be talking about Patrick Sorester. We'll be talking about ETF options, how you can spread ETF options. On behalf of the IAC, I want to thank Reggie Horner. I want to thank all of you, the attendees, for making this event so great. Thanks for joining us. And uh, keep your eyes on the IAC FX options. Lots of opportunities out there. Just, again, go to fxoptions.com, open an account through your, uh, your broker. If you have an equity options broker, you're all set. And then uh, just learn the strategy, and then you can implement it. So, again, thank you so much. On behalf of the IAC, Steve Meisinger, wish you a safe and happy trading day tomorrow. Don't forget to join us at the ETF webinar in just 25 minutes. You can sign up at the IAC site, www.iac.com. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Thank you for listening to our podcast. To find more podcasts on options, stocks, alternative markets, and market data, please visit www.iac.com slash podcasts.